Well, good day. Great to be with you. My name is Tim, and as you've heard, today we're kicking off a new series called Hashtags, uh, in which we're going to take a number of the popular claims of our day, which usually end up as hashtags on social media, though they don't always, but often do, and we're going to engage with them from a biblical perspective. And that's worth saying that the hashtags aren't, strictly speaking, the topics of the talk. Uh, each week we will pick a topic, but then the hashtags really represent uh, popular ways that our culture tends to engage with that particular topic. And so, for example, next week we're going to be thinking about the topic of power, but we'll view it through the lens of hashtag smash the patriarchy. Look forward to that. Uh, a few weeks after that, we're going to think about abortion, but we'll view it through the lens of my body, my choice. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, think about authenticity and view it through the lens of you do you. Right, so again, the, the hashtags aren't the topics of the talk, but the hashtag represent predominant ways of engaging with these topics from our culture. And so that's really where we get the subtitle of the series from. We are going to be questioning the claims of cultural orthodoxy when it comes to some of the hot topics of our day. Having said that, it's important to understand the way that hashtags work. So, for example, two of the hashtags we're going to consider are Black Lives Matter and uh, All Human, All Equal. And so you might be saying, well, hang on, questioning the claims? Are you seriously going to question whether Black Lives Matter and whether all humans are equal? No. Uh, in that sense, just to put my cards on the table, I do believe Black Lives Matter and I do believe all humans are equal. But that's not the way that hashtags work. You see... Uh, when a phrase becomes a hashtag, and it's worth saying I'm using the, hash the language of hashtags somewhat imprecisely. I'm, I'm talking about slogans. They might end up as a hashtag, it might not, but you get the idea. When a phrase becomes a hashtag, it has a way of taking on more significance and being invested with more meaning than the simple words themselves might suggest. Or if I can put that slightly differently, um, these hashtags become what we might call tips of ideological icebergs. So you can see the tip above the water, but that what goes along with it is a whole bunch of ideologies and ways of thinking and viewing the world. So uh, let me just take the example of Black Lives Matter. To say that Black Lives Matter is a pretty simple, or at least it should be, a, a very simple, straightforward claim that the Bible absolutely 100% affirms and agrees with. Furthermore, when people, many people use the phrase, that's all they're saying. Black lives matter. And I want to say amen to that. The thing is, for many others, the phrase is the tip of an ideological iceberg. And so beneath the surface of the waters are certain convictions about uh, critical race theory, intersectionality and standpoint of epistemology. Um, much of which is uh, problematic. Now, if none of those words mean anything to you, that's okay. Come back in a couple of weeks' time when we think together about racism. For now, I just want you to be aware of the way that hashtags work in the modern world. Uh, hashtags are almost never simple statements of fact. They're rallying cries. They are slogans designed to win your allegiance and encourage your activism, often in the pursuit of what ends up being an unbiblical agenda. And furthermore, they're often used in, a, in an attempt to silence dissenting opinions. And that's not always the case, to be fair. But it's often the case that some of these hashtags kind of just have a way of shutting down arguments and they're used to prevent others from interrogating the claims. And so if you can say something and then add one of the hashtags at the end of it, no one's allowed to question what you say. And so what we want to try and do over the course of this series is do what's almost impossible to do on social media. That is, without resorting to personal attacks and pretending like anyone who disagrees with us are complete idiots, we're going to try and seek to slowly and carefully uh, consider each of the claims and reflect on them from a biblical perspective. Sometimes we'll find a lot in each of these claims that we can actually affirm and agree with and is consistent with the Bible. 
Other times we might say, you know what, actually in order to be faithful to Jesus, there might be some key tenets of cultural orthodoxy that we need to reject and leave behind. Um, so I do hope you'll join us for the series. I uh, hope you'll invite your friends, whether they're believers or not. Uh, we will seek to do this with respect and humbly, uh, but we're not going to shy away from the hot topics and the hard topics, and so it may explode, but that's not the goal. Um, instead, I want to try and help alert you to what is going on in the culture around us, uh, help you identify and uh, point out some of the uh, key ideologies that will be competing for your allegiance and your activism, and then to encourage you either to remain on or maybe to return to, or perhaps actually to begin for the first time uh, down the narrow path of discipleship to Jesus Christ that leads to life. That's the goal for the series. But what about today? Uh, what are we looking at today? Well, today's topic is progress, but what we're going to try and do is engage with this topic through the lens of hashtag the right side of history. Now, uh, the concept or the topic of progress is a little slippery. Uh, it's hard to pin down and different people mean different things by the term. And so rather than beginning with my definition, instead what I want to do is actually just give you uh, four different examples from the culture of where you see the idea of progress at work, and at least in some of them, the actual phrase, the right side of history at work, because I think that's going to help us realize and identify what it is that we're talking about today. Now, just a heads up, uh, today will go a little longer than usual, not ridiculously so, but worth getting comfortable, because it'll take a bit of time. So, four examples. The first one comes from Barack Obama. Uh, Obama loved talking about being on the right side of history. It was a favorite phrase when, uh, during his presidency, he used the phrase, the right side of history, 15 times, and the wrong side of history, 13 times, right? So almost 30 times, in one way or another, he's referring to this kind of concept. Uh, he used it in a number of different situations, so uh, foreign policy, domestic policy. Let me just give you one example of it, though. Uh, this is something that he said right before signing an executive order banning workplace discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender employees. So imagine he's about to sign the executive order. He's got a group of people in front of him, and he says this. He says, many of us are only here because others fought to secure rights and opportunities for us. We've got a responsibility to do the same for future generations. I hope you're reminded of the extraordinary progress that we have made, uh, not just in the last five years, the last two years, the last one year. Uh, we are on the right side of history. Now, uh, my plan here is not to engage with the specific circumstances of each of the four different examples I'm going to give you, or frankly, even to question or imply that I'm questioning what they're saying. That's not at all what I'm doing. I just All I want you to see is the way that the concept of progress and the language of the right side of history gets used. Uh, so for Obama, progress involves fighting for the rights and the opportunities of more and more different groups of people. And in this instance, banning workplace discrimination against LGBT people is just the next step in progressing towards a more perfect union, as he would like to call it. Um, notice also that Obama identifies that step as being on the right side of history. And so there seems to be an assumption, not just that someone will one day look back and say, oh, what Obama did there was right, but almost more uh, a view of history itself that, uh, that sees history as marching forward almost, in, uh, almost inevitably towards a better future and that anyone uh, who's left behind will be seen to be on the wrong side of it. History is going somewhere. It's marching forward. So that's Obama. Uh, the second example would be from Taylor Swift. Uh, back in 2020, when the lockdown started, my wife Emma and I were trying to find something to watch on Netflix. We'd exhausted all the other things. We hadn't actually, but we'd finished maybe Lego Masters and uh, we needed something else. And so uh, we, yes, how good is Lego Masters? Anyway, that's a, that's a different sermon. Um, 
So we stumbled upon Americana, which is a documentary kind of about Taylor Swift's sort of rise to prominence, etc. And so what it does, it, it sort of charts her rise in, in fame and as kind of her career takes off, but it blends it with a growing interest that she comes to have in political activism. And so it sort of tells the story of how early on in her career, if, say, an interviewer would ask her her opinion about a political candidate, she'd say, oh, you know, um, she wouldn't answer. Who, who wants to hear from me? I'm just a country singer. You know, people just want to hear what I'm good at, which is my singing. Uh, but over the time, as she develops a platform, she starts to have a conviction that it, it's actually a moral obligation for her to use that platform to speak out on political issues and influence change. And so really the turning point in the documentary is where she makes her first ever political social media post. Uh, it's kind of this uh, tense scene where uh, the manager, I think the family, mum and dad, are, are there and they're sort of trying to talk her out of, don't do it, you know, it's career suicide. And she says, guys, I have to be on the right side of history. And then she makes this post. Uh, it's not the whole post. I think it's from 2018. It's been liked uh, two and a half million times. This is what she says. I always have and always will cast my vote based on which candidate will protect and fight for the human rights I believe we all deserve in this country. I believe in the fight for LGBTQ rights and that any form of discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender is wrong. I believe that the systemic racism we still see in this country towards people of colour is terrifying, sickening and prevalent. I cannot vote for someone who will not be willing to fight for dignity for all Americans, no matter their skin colour, gender or who they love. Now again, my goal at this point is not to question or disagree with anything she said. I just want you to notice the way the language and the ideas of progress are used. Uh, to be on the right side of history is to be on the side of those who protect and fight for the rights of others. And furthermore, at this particular point in history, uh, that is primarily demonstrated through fighting for the rights of LGBT people and people of colour. Now, I'm going to move on in just a moment, but quick sidebar. Did you notice the language of rights? So she speaks of human rights. LGBTQ rights. Obama also used the language of rights. Uh, he talked about you know, human rights and opportunities for more and more people. I'm not going to expand on this now because we're going to do a whole session on it in two weeks' time. But just keep asking yourself the question, what do they mean by rights? What are these human rights that we're fighting for? Is it the right to be treated with dignity and respect? Is it the right to have sex with any consenting adult? Is it the right to marriage? Is it the right to raise children? Is it the right to kill an unborn child? Again, it's a loose bucket and it's never quite... We want to think about this in a few weeks' time. When they speak of human rights, what exactly are they talking about? Because I'm all for treating everyone with dignity and respect. You might be here, maybe you would describe yourself as a part of the LGBT movement, community, um, welcome. It is so good to have you with us. Uh, some of what I'm going to say today may make you question whether I believe that you deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Let me say it right now. I absolutely believe that you need to be treated with dignity and respect. The question I want to ask for, just us to be thinking through is, what are people speaking about when they talk about rights? And what goes in there? So I'm going to move on. All right, so that's the, the second example. Third example is Chris Evans. Um, you may or may not be aware, latest kids movie from Pixar is called Lightyear. Uh, it's a spin-off from the Toy Story movies, you know, one, two, three, four, then it's Lightyear, Buzz Lightyear. The thing is, uh, the movie has caused quite a stir, and it's actually been banned in several countries throughout the world, because uh, Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger partner is a lesbian who gets engaged to and marries a woman. Now, most of the uproar is over a particular scene where there's a lesbian kiss. Um, but the, the kiss takes place in actually a broader montage 
where it shows the two women moving through some of you know what we might call the traditional life stages so you know falling in love getting engaged marriage pregnancy child rearing and so on and so forth anyway so chris evans uh, he is the voice for buzz lightyear in the movie uh, if you don't know who he is by the way it's captain america from the marvel movies that guy so he does the voice and in a number of interviews he's been asked what is your opinion on the pushback that the movie has been receiving. Uh, and this is what he says. He says, those people are idiots. Throughout history, you can see every time there's been social advancement as we wake up. The American story, the human story, is one of constant social awakening and growth. That's what makes us good. And when that happens, there's always going to be people who are afraid and unaware and trying to hold on to what was before. But those people die off like dinosaurs. I think the goal is to pay them mo no mind, to march forward and embrace the growth, growth that makes us human. Now, he doesn't use the language of progress or the language of the right side of history. But I think with that quote, you're starting to see maybe what is beneath the ideological iceberg of the waters and, and, and what's beneath the waters in this ideology. Uh, at least for Chris Evans, History is the story of growth through constant social awakening. And at this particular point in history, the key thing we need to wake up to as a society is the fact that sexual minorities are just like everyone else. They too can kiss, fall in love, get married, and have babies just like the rest of us. And furthermore, it's our ability to wake up to this that's always been going on that makes us good. And so anyone who tries to hold on to the past is not only an idiot, they're also going to die off like dinosaurs. What we need to do is press on, march forward, and embrace the growth that makes us human. Right? Notice the ideology. Progress is inevitable. It's going to happen, so get on board. History is going somewhere. And if you fail to sort of keep up with the pace, time will show that you were on the wrong side of history. I think that's the ideology. Fourth and final example, I'll bring it home and make it Australian, uh, the, the manly jersey. Uh, did you see this week some of the news headlines? Uh, the seven players from the NRL team, the Manly Sea Eagles, decided to sit out Thursday's game because the club wanted them to wear a uh, rugby jersey with the rainbow pride colours on it. So what was the intent? Why did the club want them to wear it? Well, in the words of Manly's coach, Des Hasler, uh, this is what he said, the jersey's intent was to support the advocacy and the human rights pertaining to gender, race, culture, ability, and LGBTQ movements. Just again, notice human rights. What are they exactly? Come back in two weeks' time and we'll think about it together. For now, though, I want you to just notice the way that people responded to these seven players who decided not to play in the game and wear the jersey. So I'm sure on your social media feed, you would have seen all sorts of articles popping up. Here's just one article that I noticed, and then I'm going to show you some of the comments that followed. So the article, it's from Pedestrian TV, confirmed seven manly players will boycott this week's match after refusing to wear pride jerseys. And then, I won't read the whole of the post, it says, Cheers to everyone except the seven blokes who turned, ruined, sorry, a progressive initiative from the club. And I'll just keep moving. <laughs> um, so that's the post. Now, the quotes, that, sorry, the comments that came next is three different comments. Uh, this wasn't all of them, uh, but this is what I saw on Instagram. Uh, comment number one, sports bring people together. It's inclusive, not exclusive. It's 2022. There's no room for such hatred and disrespect in our society. Second example, uh, none of that being gay stuff, but go ahead with the gambling, and some version of an emoji, unbelievable for 2022. And third and finally, how is it the 21st century and people are still homophobic? Grow up, stop being a hater, only thing you're doing is embarrassing yourselves. I think it was face palm emoji. Now, a couple of things to notice in there. Number one, 
notice the ideological assumptions about progress and history. There is genuine disbelief. There's, there's a shock that's almost palpable that anybody in 2022 or the 21st century could possibly hold to a moral or religious objection to wearing a pride jersey. Uh, second of all, notice the way that the language of it's 2022, it's the 21st century is used. Uh, it's used to silence dissenting opinions. Uh, that's the power of hashtag thinking. Because anyone who dares to question the ideology ends up getting labeled as a hater and a homophobe. All right. As I said, I, I didn't want to just give you my example, my, my definition. I want to try and just tease out. Here's, let, let's, let's see the way that the language and the ideology is, is used. And that, how could we define it? Well, here's my attempt to put a definition on what we've just seen. It's a view of history that assumes we are on a trajectory towards some kind of undefined social utopia where everybody has equal rights and opportunities, though we're still not sure what that is, and that anyone who gets in the way of the inevitable march of progress needs to be ignored, silenced, or mocked, kind of depending on who you ask, because time will show that they were on the wrong side of history. That's the idea that I want us to engage with together. And so what, how does the Bible help us to interact with that idea and that concept? So what are we gonna do? Well, uh, I wanna give you, in the time we have left, and again, it'll take a little longer today, uh, three reflections from the Bible about history. Number one, history will culminate in perfect justice. History will culminate in perfect justice. See, one of the things that this view gets right about history is that it, it, history is going somewhere. And so uh, back with uh, Barack Obama, one of his other favorite quotes was a quote from a guy named Martin Luther King Jr. And the, the quote, so civil rights activist, one of, the quote is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, Obama loved that quote so much, he had it woven into a rug in the Oval Office. And so for Obama and others like him, history is going somewhere. It may be slow, but it's constantly moving onwards and upwards, bending in the direction of justice. Now, I think the Bible... I do think the Bible has quite a different understanding of justice to the way that most people who hold to that view have. But I do think the idea that the instincts are right in that way of thinking. One day, perfect justice will prevail. But suppose you ask, okay, what does that look like? What is this perfect justice that the universe, or that history will one day culminate in? I think the Bible, it does help us to say a few things about it. There'll be some overlap, but some not overlap with the, if you like, uh, the secular idea of justice. Uh, first, at the end of time, when perfect justice arrives, Jesus won't just be the king, he will be recognized as the king. In the words of Philippians 2, uh, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, the greatest injustice in this world isn't sexism or racism, as horrible as those things are. The greatest injustice in this world is the fact that we don't worship and glorify God for who he is. And that is probably the biggest blind spot in the current social justice movement at the moment. Colossians 2 says that the Son is the one in whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. For true justice really to prevail, Jesus needs to not just be the king, right? He is the king at the moment. Um, all authority and on, on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. He's the king, just not yet recognized universally by all people as such. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a picture, I think, of at least one element of what will take place when perfect justice reigns. Number two, evil will be perfectly punished and paid for. See, justice 
isn't just about treating one another properly. Again, as important as that is. It's also about dealing with the wrongs of the past and ensuring they receive their just desserts. See, I think, I think this is, this at least is part of what is being grasped for. Part of what is trying to be got at any time the concept of reparations gets raised. And so whether it's to do with the um, transatlantic slave trade or you know, the stolen generation in Australia, there seems to be a recognition that for justice to be done, evil can't just be swept under the carpet. You can't just pretend that something never happened. Oh, that was in the past. We can't do anything. Let's just all move on. People say, no, something genuinely wrong happened that must be dealt with for justice to prevail. I think that's what people are grasping at. The thing is, that, that is true of yours and my sins as well. And this is what makes the gospel such good news, actually. So if, if you're here, uh, and maybe you are just kind of still exploring these things, maybe you wouldn't describe yourself as a, as a believer, can I just show you one verse? Because this, in some ways, is the beauty of what the gospel message is. It's from Hebrews 9, 27 to 28. It says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, as he did the first time, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, the reason that Jesus died on the cross was to pay the sin debt of people like you and I. Evil must be dealt with. And so in the logic of the Bible, there's only one or two options. Either Jesus pays that sin debt for you, or you pay it yourself. One way or the other, sin will be paid for and perfect justice done. I think it's the second thing you can say about this culmination of perfect justice at the end of all things. The third, and very quickly, is that at the end of time, God's people will live together in a city of love. Now, um, we had this verse read out for us before. I'll just read it for you, uh, a section of it quickly. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. This is a vision that the apostle John gets of, of heaven, basically. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or crying, mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Grace City, that is where history is headed. A new world order where peace and justice reigns and suffering is no more. And so as we finish this first point, let me just kind of say it again. I do think there is something right about the progressive view of history. History is going somewhere. It's not just a wheel doomed to spin round and round, repeating itself generation after generation, as many civilizations in the past believed. Now, history, if you like, is an arrow shot from God headed at a target. A target where justice rolls on like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. Reflection number one, history will culminate in perfect justice. It's the hope of the Bible. Reflection number two, though, history will not progress towards perfect justice. History will not progress towards perfect justice. See, one of the problems with the quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, is it, it kind of assumes almost a linear thing, like um, it'll get there in, in a line, even if it's a bendy line. Uh, in other words, it implies not just that history will culminate in perfect justice, but that it will progress there one step at a time, almost like a staircase where the final step is perfect justice. The thing is, the reason I say that's problematic is because I just don't think you see that anywhere in the Bible. Now, it's worth saying, uh, there will be Christians, and you might even be here, and maybe you would disagree with that statement. And so, for example, uh, post-millennialism is not just a long word, but it is a view of the end times that focuses on the progressive victory and expansive influence of Christianity. And so, in particular... 
post-millennialists be- most blah, blah, blah. post-millennialists believe that as more and more people are saved, the millennium will become an increasingly golden age of spiritual prosperity. And then kind of alongside of that, not just a golden age for the church, but actually almost a golden age for the world because of the church, there will be this sort of uplift in social, economic, political, and cultural life. And it's only after that that Jesus Christ will return. Now, if you hear that, and maybe that's the first time you're like, who'd believe that? It was actually the predominant uh, view of the end times for uh, Western Protestants in the 19th century. Actually, post-millennialists were at really at the forefront of some of the uh, abolition and social reform movements at that time. The thing is, it, it starts to, that view of the end time starts to drop out of favour, uh, particularly after World War I, and then by the time you get to World War II, it's basically dead in the water. Why? Well, it's very hard to make the argument that things are progressively getting better and better and better after a century in which over 100 million people have been murdered and executed. It's a bloody century. It's interesting because effectively what the wars do is force people to re-examine the Bible and in particular Revelation 20, which is where the idea comes from, and go, oh, okay, maybe we actually misinterpreted, maybe misunderstood what was going on there. So again, a simple point to say uh, the idea that history won't just culminate in perfect justice but will actually progress towards it isn't biblical. Instead, it is what scholars today would call Hegelian. Now, if you tuned out, tune back in, but I'm going to ask you to tune back in for like maybe a minute and a half at most, deep theory. Um, I promise this will land in something remotely practical. Just stick with me for a little bit here, okay? So, uh, one of the most influential philosophers or uh, theoreticians of history is a German philosopher from the 18th century named George Hegel. Uh, He proposes something called the dialectic, which is a theory about how the spirit of history moves through a series of conflicts and resolutions towards a more perfect state. And so, for example, uh, what has become known as the Hegelian dialectic would, would suggest this. Within every society, and this one includes ours, uh, and at any given time, there are certain norms, there's certain ways of thinking that we all just sort of take for granted, we all just assume to be true because it's the time that we live in. Right? That's just normal. It's the status quo. Um, Hegel calls this the thesis. So there's going to be three steps, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's the thesis. It's just the status quo. But within the thesis, even though it looks stable, it's the status quo. There are, even within it, certain internal conflicts. It has even within it the seeds that will cause its own deterioration. And so the second step, the second phase, is a growing awareness of and agitation about some of those internal conflicts, which ultimately uh, lead to a revolt against the thesis, which is called the antithesis. And then the third step is the synthesis, which is effectively the culmination or the result of the revolt and the combination of the two. Um, That effectively becomes the new order of things. The thing is, even the new synthesis, where you've landed, will still have within it internal conflicts, which over time, so that will kind of become the new thesis, and then over time the whole process gets repeated and repeated again. And so this is, you know, tuning this, I'll land it now. The basic idea of Hegel was that through an ongoing dialectic between thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, the spirit of history will gradually edge closer and closer towards a more perfect state. Now, I know that's abstract. Uh, I'll show you where we see that. But that was all to illustrate or make the point that the idea that history doesn't just culminate but progress is more Hegelian than biblical. So, why did I give you the theory? I could have just told you. Um, Why bother with the theory? Well, because I want you to be aware of what's happened since Hegel came along. Because in the hands of some of Hegel's disciples, most notably two guys, one being Karl Marx and the other Herbert Marcuse, the dialectic becomes not just a way of describing what happens in history, 
but a way of actually changing history. In other words, these two men saw in the dialectic a blueprint for social change. How do you change a society? Let me show you how. And so Karl Marx, again, this guy kind of brings about Marxism. He's the, 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 the genius, if you like, of, of Marxism. He says, hey, if we can get the working class to rise up and function a little like an antithesis and revolt against the ruling class, the thesis, then that will result in a new synthesis, a, a, a communist utopia, a socialist utopia. That's Marx. You see it also in a guy named Herbert Marcuse. He basically believed if he could stoke the frustrations, point out the inconsistencies, agitate amongst the youth, amongst women, amongst sexual minorities, even people of colour, then they would eventually rise up and overturn many of the traditional aspects of life as we know it that he saw to be unjust. In short, the dialectic gives birth to the idea that progress towards a more perfect state takes place through challenging the status quo. Let me say it again. Progress towards a more perfect state takes place through challenging the status quo. And so if you want to accelerate the idea of that utopian future, how do you do it? You challenge the status quo. You be the antithesis. You rise up and revolt against the status quo. Grace City, I think this, I think this helps us make sense of what is happening right now for us in the LGBT movement or certain elements of it. Because in the ideology of progress, LGBT rights is just the next step in the long march towards a more perfect society. Uh, it's also why Pixar includes the lesbian kiss in the movie Lightyear. They're challenging the status quo. They're trying to say, hey, uh, they too, members of the LGBT movement, they too can get married, have babies and raise kids just like a traditional so-called family. And at the risk of sounding conspiratorial, it's also why it's in a kid's movie. That's not an accident. That is straight out of the Herbert, Herbert McCuser playbook. Because uh, by exposing kids to it early and often, you're more likely to um, recruit them as allies and activists in the revolution. Come back to the question. Because if history will not will not just culminate, but will actually progress one step at a time. Sorry, if it won't do that, ha, history, uh, perfect justice will come about, but it's not going to progress there. H how does perfect justice come about then, at least according to the Bible? Well, uh, put simply, and according to the Bible, at some point in time, uh, known certainly to the Father, but not to us, Jesus Christ will return like a thief in the night, and then the end will come. Maybe there will be a time of justice then. Maybe not. It's not going to progress. Take a look. This is Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Right? The end of history won't come as a final step in a long march towards perfection. It will happen suddenly when Jesus returns like a thief in the night. And therefore, the responsibility of God's people is not to predict the exact moment that that comes, to be, but to prepare and be ready for when it does. Which leads me on to the third and final biblical reflection. Number three, Jesus will be the perfect judge of history. Jesus will be the perfect judge of history. See, one of the problems of claiming to be on the right side of history is that those who do so often have no objective reason for making the claim. See, when you get rid of a God who's outside of history, all you're left with is a view from within history. And so, inevitably, two things happen. First, being on the right side of history just ends up being synonymous with anything done in the name of progress. The problem with that is that progress is sometimes good, but it's not always good. And so, for example, progress, uh, progressives, to use that language, were on the vanguard of 
the civil rights movement, the abolition of slavery, uh, women's temperance, but they also championed eugenics. Eugenics is the idea that we should weed out inferiors from the gene pool of the future humanity. And so, uh, just an example, the Nazis were into eugenics. Now, they weren't progressive in every area, certainly, but at least on that one, you might call the Nazis progressives. No one's calling them on the right side of history. And so, you can't just claim that progress for the sake of progress is always good. It's not. And we forget that to our peril. The second issue with removing God from the picture is that our standards of what's right and wrong always just end up reflecting the spirit of the age. So you're within history and you've got a limited view of things and you just, you just mirror the spirit of the age. And so Tim Keller uh, is a pastor from the United States. He's got a great example that kind of illustrates this point, so I'll just give it to you. He says, imagine an Anglo-Saxon warrior in Britain in AD 800. The warrior has two very strong inner impulses. The first is aggression, right? He loves to smash and kill things. And if someone disrespects him, he wants to smash and kill them. Now, the spirit of that culture is honor and shame. And so he might, in that culture, identify those feelings of aggression and say, that's good, that, that's right, I, sh I should live out of that and fight for my honor and the honor of my family. But the other feeling that he might have is same-sex attraction. But given the spirit of his age, he might look at that and go, well, that's, that's not good. Uh, I need to repress that and, and push that down. That, that, that's not who I am because a different society to ours. Then Keller says, but now, now consider a, a young man walking the streets of Manhattan who has the exact same two inner strong urges and desires. He'll look at the aggression and say, that's not good. And society tells me that's not good. And so I, I got to go to anger counseling and get that dealt with and repress that. That's not who I am. Uh, but with the same sex attraction, the spirit of the age of our culture will say, no, that, that's who you are. Uh, that, that's good. Live out of that. Express those desires. The point of the illustration is really just to, to point out that without God, our standards of morality always end up matching what the spirit of the age says is right and wrong. Quite always changes. And so, therefore, while at this moment in time, there are many in our culture who will be claiming we're on the right side of history, future generations will almost certainly look back at this time and condemn us. If you're someone who likes to use the phrase right side of history, just, just think that through. Given what history has done so far, it's almost inevitable that future generations are going to look back on us right now and say, man, did you guys get that part of your thinking wrong? And therefore, the question we need to ask is whose approval are we actually living for? Whose approval are we even interested in? Are we living for the approval of future generations within history, which is almost impossible to guarantee? Or are we living for the approval of a God outside of history, who actually has an objective moral... He created the universe. He actually has an objective moral standard by which to judge the universe. Who are we living for? See, this is how the heroes of the Bible lived. Uh, not for the approval of future generations, but for the approval of God. Uh, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, we make it our goal to please who? The future generations? No, Christ. Whether we're at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, the Apostle Paul didn't live for the approval of future generations, but for the approval of Jesus Christ. And so he, he got his read on morality, not from the culture, but from Jesus himself. You see, the Bible is not the product of the first century. So I know a lot of the New, Te the New Testament comes and is written during the first century, but it's not the product of the first century. It's, actually the, it's the product of the Word of God, who's outside of history and speaks into it. That's why the Bible contradicts different cultures at different points and in different ways. And so followers of Jesus 
aren't supposed to be conservatives. We're supposed to be Christians. Sometimes that will mean we are conservative on issues. Sometimes it will mean we're progressive. Uh, for example, uh, some aspects of the Christian teaching on marriage was profoundly progressive in the first century. That husbands are told to love their wives, to cherish their wives, to sacrifice themselves for their wives, to give up their own good for their wives. Husbands are told, you don't have authority over your body. That's controversial in the first century. It's controversial today, but for different reasons. You don't have authority over your body. Yield it to your wife, husbands are told. So it's deeply progressive for the first century, but other aspects of it are also conservative because the Bible restricts and limits any form of sexual activity between a man and a woman in the union of marriage. Now, that's not because other forms of sexuality hadn't been thought of by then. Far from it. Uh, both in ancient, Greco -Roman and, uh, ancient Greece and ancient Roman cultures, um, it was entirely socially acceptable for certain men to have sex with any form of social inferior whether they be a man, a woman, or a child. And so in that context, the Bible's teaching is deeply conservative. And so again, the Bible is not the product of the first century. Because if it was, it would just match the spirit of the day. It's the product of a God outside of history, which ends up judging every culture in slightly different ways. So Grace City... Jesus will be the judge of history. Now, he's going to use an objective standard, his good word. And so the question we've got to ask is, where are we with him? So let me close with two very quick points of application. Number one, if you want to be on the right side of history, trust in Jesus and live to please him. At the end of the day, Jesus is the one who's going to judge history, not some nameless multitude of future generations. So you want to be on the right side of history, live in accordance with his word. Now, at times, that will mean that people within our culture will look at you and say, you're on the wrong side of history. That's okay. You're not living for their approval. You're living for the approval of the one who's actually going to judge history, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remain faithful to him, he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Second of all, please don't surrender to the inevitable march of progress. Don't surrender to the inevitable march of social progress. You see, one of the reasons the ideology of progress is so influential is that we can fall for the trap of assuming that certain things are just inevitable. And so therefore, rather than standing up, uh, and voicing a dissenting opinion, saying something controversial that we might believe in, and we just sort of keep quiet and assume that even if we say something, it won't make a difference. This is where you've got to remember, the inevitable march of progress is far more Hegelian than it is biblical. And so let me just give you an example. I'll drop a bit of a, a bomb here and then I'll run off. Uh, consider what's happened in the US recently. We're going to talk about abortion in maybe th three weeks' time or something. Uh, so come back more then. But how many people, like seriously, how many people really thought that Roe versus Wade would ever get overturned? Uh, if you're not aware, last month, the US Supreme Court overturned a landmark decision from 1973 that affirmed the constitutional right to an abortion. The right, by the way. Just keep that in mind. What is human rights? Now, I suspect a whole bunch of people just assumed that battle was lost. I mean, we live in a secular, progressive society, don't we? So pff, that's lost. Let's not fight that battle. But to their credit, many people in America, most of whom, but not all, were Christians, pushed back, and after 50 years, that was overturned. Now, again, I know it's kind of, uh, kind of a controversial one, so we'll deal with it in a couple of time, weeks' time, but just, the thing I want you to see is that progress is not inevitable. As Christians, we're called to be salt and light, to stand up for justice and to care for the oppressed. Why? Not so that we can pr gradually progress towards a more perfect society before Jesus arrives back, but because that's what obedience to Jesus in the present actually looks like. 
And so if you want to be on hashtag the right side of history, trust in Jesus and seek to live in obedience to his word. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our true north. We thank you that your word speaks truth into a time and a culture where uh, there are many different competing voices trying to get us to side with them. Lord, help us to hear amidst the cacophony, amidst the, the chorus, help us to hear your voice. And then help us to, to sing that voice. That there is a God who loves us, who sent his son to die for us. And that one day, every tear will be wiped away. Death will be no more. And we will live with you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.